Please turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 18. I'm sure this is a very familiar passage uh, from the New Testament. And it is probably one of the most important passages because it brings up the the truth of the Incarnation. Uh, There's a lot of theology in these few verses that's very important not to just what we believe, but to what we receive from God and what God has done for us. Verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Our title today is Jesus is the Light. In our lesson at the beginning of the very Gospel of John, The Apostle John introduces us to Jesus. And from what he says, we see that Jesus was indeed a man. But John wants us to know that Jesus is much more than just a man. To establish the basis for his premise, he reaches back before the beginning of time to show us how much more than just a man this Jesus really is. John begins his gospel quoting Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. You recall that the full text reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And as John introduces Jesus of his gospel, he equates Jesus with the Word and identifying this Word as God. However, This identification with God is somewhat complex as John places this word in three distinct positions. First, he's simply the word. In other words, he is a separate and unique personage in himself. Second, the word was with God, indicating a relationship on par with God. So the Word is equal to God in every possible way. And third, he tells us that the separate and unique personage of the Word and God were equally and inseparably one God. So in other words, John introduces Jesus in the context of the Trinity. As a member of the Trinity, The Word was necessarily involved in the creation, as John postulates in verses 2 and 3. He says he was 
in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. That shows you how important this person called the word is to our very existence. All things are made through him. So what was not made through him? He said the trees were not made by him. Sun was not made by him. Mountains were not made by him. Somebody stop me. All things were made by him. And even more important, without him, nothing was made that was made. So this word, this second person of the Godhead is extremely important to the creation, to everything that exists today, and very important for you and me and all humanity. John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew it was absolutely necessary to establish the divine nature of Jesus, the Word, to give credibility to the gospel that Jesus brought. Jesus was a man, but yet Jesus was much more than a man because Jesus is identified with the Word. So the Word was not Jesus in the total sense of his person. This is maybe a little difficult for us to really understand. It's, it's a mystery. But John shows us the Word had an existence before the world was created, which tells us the Word existed before the man Jesus. In the context of the immediate statement of John, the Word is not spoken of as the man Jesus. It is spoken of as the person of the Godhead who became a man. In other words, the incarnation. And John ties the word and the incarnation to the man Jesus in verse 14. He writes, And the word became flesh and dwelt. The word flesh and the word dwelt are very important to this teaching of the incarnation, okay? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that word begotten is very important. The word was not begotten. The word is eternal because he's part of the Godhead. But that word became flesh. And that flesh was begotten of God. A miracle that we can't possibly understand. The Word is clearly the second person of the Godhead. And now we see this divine person being made flesh and taking on the human nature of mankind. Albert Barnes helps to clarify what John means here. He wrote, Here it is meant that the Word, or the second person of the Trinity, whom John had just proved to be equal with God, became a man, or was united with the man Jesus of Nazareth, so that it might be said that he was made flesh. Becoming or being made flesh is a secondary action that follows the pre-existence of the Word. He existed as the Word eternally before this. And secondly, in time, he became a man. Jesus affirmed this very fact in Hebrews 10, verse 5, where it says, Therefore, when he, meaning Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. The writer of Hebrews stresses the fact that the Word took on a real human body and a real human nature in Hebrews 2, verse 14. He says, inasmuch then 
as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. The word, when he became man, took on a real human body. He took on a real human nature. Boy, that's powerful. I don't understand it. I really don't. But you know, I believe it. And I understand that this was necessary in God's plan of salvation for the human race. So in opening his gospel, John establishes the fact of the incarnation which the rest of his gospel as well as the entire New Testament attest to. The incarnation is essential to God's act of redemption and without the incarnation there is no possible solution for the sins of the human race. Jesus became a man as the result of the word taking on a human body that was provided by an act of God through the Virgin Mary. Now understand this. The divine nature of the, ver of the word was not changed into a human nature. And the human nature of the baby born to Mary was not changed into the divine nature. The relation of the divine and human natures in the one man, Jesus, is beyond our ability to comprehend. It is simply something we must accept by faith. But that begs the question, why did the word take on humanity? In verse 14 of our text, John says the purpose of the incarnation was so that the word could dwell among us as a man in our flesh and in so doing to experience life as we experience life. As Jesus lived his daily life, his divinity also experienced a human daily life. In Jesus, God experienced what it was to be happy, to be sad, to be hungry. He experienced what it is to have friends and to be loved and to be hated and be persecuted. In Jesus, God experienced the joy of some being brought into a right relationship with God and the sorrow of those that rejected God. In Jesus, God experienced all human emotions and frustrations. He was disappointed. And sometimes he was frustrated over the situations of life, just like you and I have disappointments and frustrations. And more importantly, especially to us, in Jesus, God experienced the temptation and spiritual opposition common to humanity. So John answers the question of why did the word take on humanity in verse 4? Because in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now that statement is an immediate reference to creation. As God created everything through the Word, the Word was an essential part of the breath of life God breathed into Adam to make him a living being. We know that the fall of Adam and the introduction of sin into the world happened in the third chapter of Genesis. The, the incarnation is the antidote to that sin as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, where he wrote, For as in Adam all die. Okay? How many die? That means every human being, right? Ever to come into existence. Ever to yet come into existence. 
whereas in Adam all die, even so, in like manner, equal to or corresponding to, in Christ shall all, how many? All be made alive. In other words, Jesus came to undo for those who receive him what Adam did to the whole human race. Because of Adam's sin, all people are born into this world spiritually dead because they do not have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that is spiritual life. John says that Jesus is the light. The world, or all that are spiritually dead, do not comprehend or understand the light. And for this reason, it was essential for Jesus to come in the incarnation. So while the unregenerate do not understand this truth, it is still necessary to receive it in faith, believing it even though we don't understand it. John said in verses 12 and 13, But as many as received him, to them gave uh, he gave the right to become children of God, to those that believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We do not have to understand the theology of what God has provided for us. We just need to receive or accept the fact that Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. Repenting of sin is an act of receiving Jesus because in repenting, you are giving Jesus your sins for which he died. But there is more in receiving Jesus than just forgiveness of sins. John tells us that in receiving Jesus, we are born again. He calls it born of God. Now that does not mean that we are just religious people. It means that we have been morally and spiritually changed. And John says of this change in verse 16, and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. Well, what is this fullness we receive? Well, that word fullness means to be filled completely, like a jar filled with water. Have you ever put a jar under a faucet or in a hose and put water into it all the way up to the top? Okay, what's in that jar? Water. No air. You know, you don't fill it up halfway. You fill it all the way to the top. Okay, so being, having received the fullness we are filled up completely like that jar with water. Well, the Living Bible puts the verse simply this way. We have all benefited from the rich blessings he brought to us. Blessing upon blessing heaped upon us. I like that. Blessing upon blessing heaped upon us. More than we could even comprehend. More than we could ask for. Blessings heaped upon us. Grace for grace, or blessing upon blessing, is that as a sinner, our hearts were filled with sin, which separated us from God. But in receiving Jesus, that sin is not just forgiven, but our hearts are cleansed so that there is no more sin, and the Holy Spirit comes in to fill our hearts as that water completely fills the jar. Jesus is the light, and he is our only hope for salvation. His work of atonement did for us what nothing else could ever do. It's not enough to be a good person. There are a lot of good people in the world, and a lot of people feel that that goodness 
is going to get them right with God, get them into heaven if there is a heaven to get. But that's not true. It's not enough to be a church member. Just because your name is written down on some church book is not guaranteed that you'll get to heaven. Your name must be written in the Lamb's book of life. And it is not enough to say that you are a Christian. I tell you what, there are a lot of people that say they are Christians. And a lot of them that are not here today in this church service say they're Christians. It's not enough. Simply receive him in faith and allow his light to make you a new creation, cleansed from sin and filled with the Holy Spirit. Let him make you a child of God. Amen.